Hi, and welcome to the Wednesday morning Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition campaign prep stream with Nicholas Corey. I'm Nicholas Corey, and I need to come up with a more concise way to describe exactly what this stream is. I'm, I'm pretty bad with titles. It usually takes me a few times to get into it. Um, if you watch the introduction video or if you were here for that stream, then you know that this is a stream series that I'll be doing every Wednesday morning, uh, usually between the hours of 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. in and around there, at least until my son's done with uh, preschool. And uh, since I usually use that time to prep my Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition campaigns anyway, I figured why not utilize the webcam that I have and the mic uh, that I have and uh, stream some of that. Since I have the resources and the ability and the tools to do so, why don't I do that? Um, so let's talk about my campaigns. I mentioned them both in the introduction stream or the introduction episode, but in case you didn't see that, uh, or just to recap, I have two different D&D 5th edition campaigns. One of them is ongoing and the other one is starting uh, in a couple weeks. The ongoing one is an adaptation of the Ghosts of Saltmarsh campaign, which I actually have that book right here. I'm kind of prepared for this. Uh, it's an adaptation of the Ghosts of Saltmarsh uh, campaign book. I'm using most of the material in here and I'm combining that with some of the material in the Tales from the Yawning Portal. There we go. There. Um, so I'm combining those two books uh, to create a campaign. Um, so for instance, my players, they're, they've already played through the first, I think, four sessions or the four adventures in Ghosts of Saltmarsh. And the first... Um, actually, they just played one dungeon in Tales from the Yawning Portal so far. And that was uh, the Forge of Fury, which is an old dwarven stronghold that's been taken over by orcs. They went through and cleaned that out. And that has had repercussions in the Ghost of Saltmarsh campaign. And that that Ghost of Saltmarsh campaign is really kind of taking a bit of a turn lately, narratively and, and tonally. It started off as like happy-go-lucky, like, hey, we got a ship, let's go out on the high seas and be smugglers and, and do all kinds of whatever, you know, whatever we want to do on the high seas. And it's now sort of taken a turn after the events of the last session to be a little bit more of a um, darker mystery slash pseudo-political drama, not really, um, simply because of the events that have taken place in the city of Saltmarsh since the players completed their last adventure. The second campaign, the one that I'm prepping for that hasn't started yet, that we're actually making characters for this coming Saturday, is uh, it's a Hex Crawl campaign. Hex Crawl. And uh, I have the the campaign doc up right now on my stream that you can see it's called the heart of Shatrokus. Um, and this, uh, campaign is going to start with, uh, a bit of a, uh, an intrigue mystery sort of investigation adventure. And then from there, it's going to progress into the jungle hex crawl. And for that, I'm using a lot of, um, information, an inspiration from the uh, Tomb of Annihilation. Now, I don't have that book physically, but I do have access to that on D&D Beyond, as you can see here. Uh, so I'm going to be going through here and mining some of this stuff for inspiration. I have created my own map for this session, or for this campaign, my own hex crawl map. Uh, let me pull that up. That is the small version of it. Um, I'll get a full... I'll get a full screen image up here at some point um, in a future stream. But that's the that's the small version of it. As you can see, there are individual hexes. Each hex is going to take them roughly a day to get through, depending on their speed and how well they do on their tests. Um, so for my campaign prep, uh, I'm not sure which campaign we're going to start with. Why don't we start with Heart of Chitrokas, since I have that open. Let's start with this one. So now, already I've done a few hours worth of work prepping this campaign, specifically the first session. And I, I have detailed it more than I usually do. And I think that was the impetus. So that was what inspired me to just say, hey, well, why don't we just stream this? Um, so for instance, I have here an overview um, because I'm the type of person that when I start a campaign and not not the pre-bought stuff, not the pre-published you know, works from Wizards, as great as they are, but when I start something that is my creation, like the Heart of Shatrokas. Um, I like to know the whole arc for it or where it's going to end. Uh, I am very much a roller coaster DM, and what I mean by that is that I keep the the players on rails to a degree. 
Now, I know that that kind of has a stigma in uh, the role-playing community, saying that I, I'm a railroader. But um, I think what it comes down to is ultimately I, I'm more about having the players react to my world rather than having my world react to the players. Um, I like to present my players with very interesting and fun setup and kind of see where they go with things. Uh, I have the world change to the players. Like, it's more of a symbiote, you know, relationship than it is just like, here's an event, what do you do? Um, but at the same time, I also tend to game with players who prefer that style of play, who prefer to have a set narrative that they can influence and that they can uh, um, make their own decisions within. Uh, but a set narrative that, that they're progressing through. And the nature of that narrative may change from one session to the next. For instance, with Ghosts of Saltmarsh, again, it started out, and I assumed it was just going to be um, pirate fun on the high seas. And that was what we all kind of assumed. Like, it started off with them exploring a haunted house, and then they got a ship uh, as a result of that session. And then they hired a crew for that ship, uh, and the crew turned out to be very interesting and very diverse and kind of like wackety schmackety do to a certain degree. And then um, from there, they just went out and they did jobs. And there were a couple of moments where they were like, oh, there's there's some other stuff going on here. And like some of the people on the town council have their own uh, motives and their own, you know, it's they're not they're not sharing all the information with us, which why would they? Why would they? I mean, if you're hiring someone to do a specific job and there might be, you know, shady things behind that job why would you tell them everything so anyway um but then because of the choices that they made in a particular session uh that drastically changed the tone of the campaign going forward um and made it a little darker a little more uh, a little more serious and i really i really latched onto that i really like that because one the end of this campaign spoiler alert for anybody who has not is not familiar with um the uh, Ghost of Saltmarsh, but the final uh, adventure is called The Styes, and it is a very Lovecraftian style, starts out as a murder mystery, and then it progresses from there, and you're dealing with a uh, cult, but it's not like a dragon cult, it's not like the cult of Tiamat, where you have dragons flying over and everything like that, it's not even like a cult of Orcus, where you have undead, uh, it's a cult of Tharzadun, and uh, which, by the way, I'm gonna—I have a bone to pick with Tharz, not with Tharzadun, but with wizards. In some texts, it's Tharzadun. In some texts, it's Thrazadun. Like I've seen it both ways. I prefer Tharzadun myself. It's a little easier to say. But anyway, um, yeah. So that last session is very—it's a very Innsmouth um, secret cult, and that's that's kind of a darker, more serious tone. And in order to get there, I'm happy that we had this mid-campaign sort of turn. But anyway, I said we would start with the Heart of Shatrokas. So that's what we're going to do, despite all this talk about Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Um, I don't have a, I should say real quick, I don't have a script for these um, prep sessions. And uh, I, I started to type one out, and then I kind of got like, well, you know, I don't, I don't think I need one. And so far, that's proving true. I don't need one. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to pause for just a brief second. I'm going to share links to the Twitch um twitch stream just in case anybody wants to join us and of course right now i am speaking to anybody who's watching this vod because currently there are no viewers on the stream because i'm super popular like that campaign prep stream um so anyway with the heart of shatrokas i wanted to have an idea of where that campaign was going to go from the outset, um, because that's how I, again, that's how I like to run my games. I feel like a game is so much more um, exciting or interesting, or it, it has it has more room to grow if you have an idea, not room to grow, that's a bad way to say it. It's more like you're better able to seed things and foreshadow things, and also to develop certain details if you have an idea for the overall path of the campaign before you ever start playing. And I think that's really important. And so that's what I did with Heart of Shatrokas. And you can kind of see that in this doc. And I'm going to go over more of that in just a second here. Okay. I'm just going to share this link a couple times. I really should have done this before I started streaming. But this is... I'm relatively new to this. <laughs> in case that isn't obvious. Um, that music at the beginning, uh, that was... 
Um, that was a, a track that I had created. I had paid to have it created for a totally separate um, project that may or may not happen uh, anymore. Uh, not sure. It was a podcast idea that has sort of kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, so, but I was like, you know, since I have the music, let's use the music, right? Anyway, okay, so let's dig into the heart of Shatrokas. So I wanted to have a, an overview of this campaign uh, from the from the get-go. So that's what I did, is I created this introduction sheet. Now, everything, even though I have this written down, everything in this introduction sheet and everything, all the details going forward, could and very likely will change. None of this is set in stone, and I think that's my first real tip. Um, well, my second. My first was have an idea for how you want the campaign to end, and my second is... Um, Nothing set in stone. So even that idea you have for an ending, that could very well change as you're playing. And you have to be open, and uh, you have to be open to it changing, and you have to totally embrace that. Not just be open to it, but you have to embrace it. So with the Heart of Shatrokas, um I didn't plan for six adventures. That was not a plan at all. That was just me, me writing this up, and six was where it naturally came to its conclusion. I think it, probably about halfway through, I realized, like, yeah, six would be a good number. So, we're starting with Adventure 1, which is Secrets and Lies in Viscara City. I knew that I wanted to... I didn't want to just put the players on a hex crawl and say, there's all this wilderness, go explore it. Because that's not very engaging. Um, I wanted to give the players uh, an engaging reason, a very uh, player-centric reason, to explore this jungle, the jungles of Viscara. Excuse me. And I decided that the best way to go about doing that uh, was to create an NPC, uh, start them with ties to a specific NPC, who then goes missing. Uh, it's a little, that's a little contrived, I understand, but at the same time, uh, two of these players are brand new to Dungeons and Dragons. One of them is brand new to the hobby in general, has never played a role-playing game. And one of them is my nine-year-old daughter. I have four players. So we have one who's brand new to role-playing games in general, one who's brand new to Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, one who's my nine-year-old daughter, who has played a few games before and, and understands the basics, and uh, uh, one of my good friends who is a veteran of role-playing games has been playing them with me, if not other people, for years. So I have really a diverse selection of, of experience or a diverse group with different levels of experience uh, and exposure to the hobby. And I knew that I wanted to provide them, like I said, with an NPC. It's a good, it's an easy way to get buy-in or to get feel like they're connected to something is to give them a resource, a contact in the game world and uh, then take that away. And that's exactly what happens, is they get letters, and I, hopefully I'll actually have physical letters that I will hand to the players, that is this archaeologist, I'm sorry, anthropologist friend of theirs named Ebris, who is a Loxodon, which is a big elephant man. Um, Ebris is uh, requesting that they come to Viscara City to uh, help him deal with an artifact called the Heart of Shatrokus. Uh, he says that the artifact belongs, uh, it needs to be brought back to its resting place in the Viscara jungle. Um, and he fears that there are people that are coming after him. Um, and so then the advent the adventure starts, the campaign starts, with them outside of Ebris's house. And then from there, they're going to discover clues that see that he's been missing. They're going to find um, different information that leads them to uh, signs of a struggle. And then they'll follow up on those leads. And I'll talk more about that first session in just a second. Or that first adventure, rather. But my goal my goal for that first adventure is to get them to third level. And then, uh, from there, and like I said, you can see that some of these bolded points are the important information that I want to... Because I can read and write all this stuff, and writing it kind of cements it in my mind a little bit, but I can, I can do that all day. But when I'm playing, I'm probably never going to look at this document. And even if I do, I'm probably just going to skim it, and that means anything in bold is stuff that I'm throwing out for myself to see. So for instance, the Azure Rose is something that I want them to become aware of. They need to become aware of that in this session. Um, the Spectres of Shatrokas will make an appearance in this session. Skathos will be mentioned, if not encountered, in this session. He is the campaign villain. 
um, Zakora will be mentioned in this session, and that is the legendary city from which the heart of Shatrokas has been stolen from. Um, and then we go into uh, the F Adventure 2, and from here I'm going to be much more brief. I, I went kind of in detail on that first adventure because I have the details written for that, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the, the next adventure is the first journey. That's a very generic title. I just named it that because by this point, the adventurers should be prepared and ready to go into the jungle. Um, this is when they'll be leaving uh, civilization and proceeding into the wilderness of Viscera. And I give them three different points to choose from. They can go from Viscera City, which is out here. They can go from... Uh, what are the other options? Uh, Fort Windermere or Camp Solitude. Fort Windermere is down here, and Camp Solitude is up there. All three of those are various starting locations, um, and those will influence what they encounter first or what they encounter early in the campaign versus late. The goal is to get uh, somewhere down in this area. I don't know if you can see. I can barely see my cursor, but you see this volcano um, somewhere south and west of that. I haven't picked an exact hex for their destination, and I may not pick an exact hex for the destination. That's kind of the fun of a hex crawl, is that uh, um, the whole point is to provide them with unique challenges uh, with, you know, every time they go into the jungle or every time they venture through the wilderness. And with this map, this particular map here being the one that I see as the GM, I have a separate one for the players where a lot of this is grayed out. With this being the map that I see, if they're heading in a certain direction and I decide that, you know, things have gone too long without a special event, I could move something. I could move a, put a monster lair in their uh, path. I could move some plot critical element into their path and they're never going to be any, any the wiser. And that's, that's part of the fun of running games. Um, so the first journey does that. This is, I expect this to take multiple sessions. I expect that first adventure to take probably two or three sessions. Like I said, there'll be level three by the end of it. Um, by the end of adventure two, uh, the first journey, I expect that to take another three or four sessions of them just going through the wilderness, dealing with uh, disease and foraging for food or, or uh, conserving their rations, um, that sort of thing. And I'll talk about the mechanics that I have planned for that. I, I like to go kind of light on those. But anyway, it ends uh, with an event that I just titled The Feast for Jokers. And I don't know if that's going to be the final title. I don't know. It's just I have a basic idea in my head of what I want to happen at the end of this adventure, and I want it to be an event so that regardless of where they are physically on the map, and we just talked about this, regardless of where they are physically on the map, I can plop this event in there and we can end the second stage of this campaign with that. And the whole idea is that the Feast for Jokers is an event where they go into a temple. So let me give a little bit of background now. Uh, the campaign's called The Heart of Shatrokas. What is Shatrokas? Shatrokas is an ancient lizard folk, like no longer worshipped. Like this is pre, in, in my campaign world, the lizard folk, or a, a pretty large majority of them, have reached a civilized state. They have a city. They have learned that by cooperating and working with other civilized races that will increase their chances of survival. And thus they have grown to uh, mimic, not mimic, but they have grown to adopt some some uh, um, habits and uh uh, just the ways of other people. And so they have a city, Viscara City. Uh, super original, using the same name of the jungle as the city. But anyway, so they have their own city. And the uh, there are still some tribal nomadic lizard folk that live in the jungles of Shatrokas. And they still worship the ancient gods in the ancient pantheon of old. And the foremost god is Shatrokas. Shatrokas is the god of knowledge. Like, if she had domains as a cleric, uh, they would be the um, knowledge and grave domains. So she's all about... She's very Raven Queen-esque, I just realized. And that might be influenced by my other campaign, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so she governs uh, knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge and secrets, and also the preservation and protection of that knowledge from people who don't, who shouldn't have it. And then also the grave, the barrier between life and death, and that thin veil between the waking world and the shadow fell. Or, in this campaign world, the nether ash. I, of course, I have to change everything. I, I can't just deal with that. Anyway, so there are... There's Shatrokas, and then there are five um, lesser deities who all have their own domains and all have their own uh, their own focuses and and uh, and that sort of thing. And they don't have as many worshippers as Shatrokas does because she's the primary deity. Excuse me. But um, 
this event, the Feast for Jokers, that's going to finish off our uh, second adventure, the first real foray into, the, foray into the jungle. Feast for Jokers, I plan to be some sort of temple devoted to one of these gods, one of these lesser deities. And there will be trials in that temple. And my inspiration comes from, uh, well, it's very Indiana Jones-like, and that's kind of the tone I'm going for this set, for this campaign. But also, uh, I think back to like Final Fantasy X and the Summoner Trials, if you're familiar with those. So the idea is that there's going to be these, these shrines or these temples, these ruins, are going to be mostly puzzles with a few interesting combat encounters. Maybe some of the tribal lizard folk will be there. Maybe there will be like a guardian that protects the temple that you have to defeat in order to get in. But the point is that at some point, because all of these lesser deities are vying for the seat of the prime deity that Shatrokas enjoys, and now that Shatrokas has lost her heart, the physical gemstone artifact that represents her heart, her power, her knowledge, um, now that's kind of up for grabs. So Feast for Jokers, again, that's not a, that's a working title. It just sprang to me. But it's going to represent one of these lesser deities... Um, inflicting a member of the party, whether that's a PC or an NPC ally that they might have with them, with what's called Phantom Rot, which is a uh, unique disease that I'm going to be creating specifically for this campaign. It's going to have its own properties. I haven't worked on that yet. And then that lesser deity basically says, um, it basically creates a, a bargain with these people saying, if you complete whatever, do if you make it to Zakora, and when you are returning the heart of Shatrokas, if you would instead do, and I'd have something else in place there, something that would um, be beneficial to the deity that inflicted the Phantom Rot, then they will remove that from the character that has it. Now the problem, and again, since a lot of these players, since three of the four players in this campaign are pretty new, two of them extremely new to role-playing games, I think that just inflicting an NPC with Phantom Rot would probably be enough of a pull for them. If they have an NPC in the party, that's also contingent. I'll get to that in a little bit. I keep saying I'll get to that in a little bit. I really hope I will get to this stuff. If not, I don't want to leave you guys hanging. But anyway, I guess that's what future episodes are for. Anyway, so we have Feast, of, Feast for Jokers leads to the Phantom Rot. Third part of the adventure is pretty much the same as the uh, second. I should say same as the second, not the first. Uh, because it's just another excursion out into the wilderness. They're going hex by hex, but now there's a little bit more of a time crunch on it. Um, we established a bit of a time crunch with... Uh, oh, and now... There we go. Okay. We established a bit of a time crunch with the Spectres of Shatrokas in the first adventure. They are showing up, and they are attacking mortals. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Mortals who are in any way... Uh, present in the Viscaran jungle, and even in Viscara city, as is present in the first one. But they're attacking mortals because the heart of Shatrokas is missing, and it's their job to find it, and they don't have any leads as to where it is. So that means that the players could potentially uh, negotiate with the, with the specters, because they don't have the heart at this point. They're chasing the person who does. Um... So, so that establishes, so we have the, uh, the specters, and then the phantom rod establishes a bit more of a time crunch on these players, uh, encouraging them onward it also gives them another reason that they have to complete this mission because at any point the players could just go why are we even chasing this guy why are he's bringing the heart to the city of zakora uh, he's probably not going to put it back he's probably going to take more stuff from the city but he's like he's going out into the jungle why are we why are we even chasing him? Why don't we go do other stuff? And so Phantom Rot is kind of like a, an insurance policy. I might even move in. I might even move Phantom Rot further up in the campaign now that I think about it. I kind of like the idea of the specters inflicting it, but then that takes out that dynamic between the lesser deities and Shatrokas. So I don't know. These are the kind of questions that I ask myself while I'm working on a campaign. I think largely about story beats and plot points and, uh, and about um, where my players, where I think they'll be at. Uh, mentally and emotionally as far as investment in this campaign and so the phantom rot will increase that investment but then that's also like eight sessions in at this point so i don't know if it's if that's a great spot for it but anyway um so uh, okay i just realized that what i just described verbally is different than what i have written here interesting um so my original plan as written here and as i'm reading now is that in order to remove phantom rot from their ally then they have to find they have to visit a different shrine other than zakora and i don't like that now that i'm talking about that i don't like that idea um because that that is it's almost like an artificial 
secondary objective. You know what I mean? Artificial as in, why can't I have everything feed to the primary objective? And have, I personally like secondary objectives to be things the players come up with on their own and not things I impose on them as a DM. Excuse me. So, I think I'm going to get rid of that. Um, if the players wish to remove Phantom Rot from their ally, they will... Oops, let's get the bold off of there. Ooh, everything's running a little slower. They will have to complete a specific task antithetical to returning the heart of Shatrokus while at the city of Zakora. So that way we keep them on the path to Zakora. We don't force them to diverge. Um, so now this changes because then the event that was going to finish this adventure was going to be the trickster's task, which was going to be them getting rid of Phantom Rot. So I'm just going to take that out of there. We're not going to have an event at the end of the Phantom Rot adventure. And again, this is all stuff, like I said, when we started, a lot of this can and will change. I, that's already happening. But my goal is that they are level 5 at the end of Adventure 2, the first journey, and then um, at the end of Adventure 3, which again, I plan for each of these to be about four sessions, give or take. At the end of Phantom Rot, they should be level 6. Uh, the fourth part is Ancient Slopes. And Ancient Slopes, uh, we're not, we don't have the Shrine of Kavax in there anymore. So, um, so I'll just delete all of this first stuff and I'll have to come up with something for that later. Or maybe as we're talking here, because I find that just talking this out, uh, illuminates a lot of different things as we discovered with, with the Phantom Rod. Um, okay. So at this point they come across, uh, evidence of the Azure Rose, which is there. That's who they're following. Now, again, that's four, eight, 12. That's roughly... 13 to 15 sessions into the campaign they finally come across so we definitely need the azure rose to make an appearance before that um hint at azure rose throughout uh the azure rose is essentially a thieves guild they're a criminal organization led by scathus uh male tiefling bard and um scathus uh, he has taken the heart of Shatrokus from Ebrus, who was the NPC that we mentioned at the beginning, the the player's um, impetus for going on this adventure. And he's bringing it into the jungle because he gets power from this artifact. And his whole thing is, I just want to collect... He's an artist. Uh, so he wants to collect um, baubles and trinkets and artifacts, especially those that give him magical abilities uh, that increase his hold over the city of Viscara. So he has the heart of Shatrokus. And he's like, you know, this came from Zakora City. And nobody knows where Zakora is, but Zakora is rumored to be filled with artifacts like this. I'm going to go in and get it. So he takes a significant portion of his criminal organization, the Azure Rose, out into the jungles with him. And so I, I don't want the players to specifically encounter, like, okay, they, well, no, that's not true at all. They should encounter, they should encounter the Azure Rose within this adventure. Because I want them to feel like they're making progress. And if I hold that encounter with the Thieves Guild until session 13, 14, 15, they're not going to feel like they're making progress. We're going to get to like session nine or even session six or whatever. And they're going to be like, oh, why is this, you know, why is this taking forever? What's going on? Um, so I definitely want to drop those breadcrumbs as we go. But I think here, instead of coming across evidence of the Azure Rose, they will come across a sub-boss of the Azure Rose. And I already have planned that um, I haven't created any any of these villain, like any of their monster stat blocks yet, because I don't want to. Uh, I might I might make one for Scathus, just because I like the idea of them encountering him in session one when he's way more powerful than them, and then he just kind of leaves them, leaves them unconscious. Uh, and then that, that will kind of uh, encourage them or rather, it'll light the fire under their asses to go get them. Language, sorry. Um, that kind of stuff is fun. It's hard to pull off. But I think that if you have a villain who is super confident, like overconfident, laser focused on a specific goal, uh, then that will create in him, generally, the fact that he doesn't care about the heroes, especially when they're only level 
at this point, two at the beginning or halfway through Secrets and Lies of Viscara City. They're only going to be level two. They're going to get level three at the end of that session. So if they fight Scathus while they're level two, he should wipe the floor with them and leave them unconscious. Uh, and he's not going to worry about killing them because he doesn't see them as a threat. And that's that'll give them, that'll create this awesome arc, this uh, um, trajectory of growth for them so that when they face him again, uh, they're much stronger. And maybe they maybe they see Scathus and they just face one of his lieutenants, one of his sub-bosses, and then that sub-boss is the same one they face here. Because I already have an idea that it's going to be Scathus and like three or four lieutenants. And so if they face one of the lieutenants in the Ancient Slopes adventure, and then the another one in Zakora and the last two in Tomb of Shatrokas with Scathus, that'd be a fun, uh, a fun, what do you call it, progression. So Ancient Slopes is, again, it's more jungle expedition, which that's pretty much these three. These three adventures here are all just jungle expedition, but with different flavors. I'm going to have to come up with something else, uh, something else at the end of Phantom Rot to kind of mark the end of one section of the one act and moving into another. Ancient Slopes, I expect by them to be more in the southwest portion of this map, where the jungle is much more varying height elevations and that sort of thing. Um, and then we have Zakora, which is Adventure 5, and this is... Uh, this is a bit like, it's almost like a, not a mega dungeon, but it's a ruined city. I'm glad I decided to bring my water down. I'm talking so much that I, whew, dries out my throat. Um, so, okay, so the uh, Zakora is inside a basin. And I don't have a, sp again, I don't have a specific spot, but it's it's in like a valley. It's super hard to get to. And that's part of the reason why it's remained hidden for so long. So part of it will be navigating down into the basin to get to the city itself. It also provides them with, at the start of the adventure, they get this, you know, this sweeping vista of the city laid out below them and the ruins and everything. And maybe they could see some monsters or creatures moving around inside, but largely it's just going to be this big, beautiful landscape. Hopefully I can find some art online or something that I can show them to evoke that i'm thinking uh uncharted was it two i think it was uncharted two that um did that <laughs> um anywho where was i okay uh so yeah so then uh navigating zakora i foresee this being this is a crumbling ancient city that's huge and i foresee it being more vertical than uh, sprawling. Like, it'll probably be pretty sprawling, but the center of it especially will be a very vertical city. There will be streets and everything above streets. Um, and so I like the idea of, like, player characters having to navigate that, the up and down and the the, um, the verticality of the location, uh, falling through crumbling ruins and stuff like that. And then finally, because I realize I'm already spending half of this episode just catching you up on the, on the campaign, that's not great prep, is it? Although we did some good, we did some stuff up there. Adventure six is the Tomb of Shatrokas. That's that is a, uh, a mega dungeon, um, mega dungeon navigation. Hopefully they'll be uh, level eight by the time they start this. The goal is to end at level ten, and they will uh, deal with Scathus while in there, and they'll also make the choice whether or not to um, dethrone Shatrokas and uh, and elevate one of the other lesser deities in order to remove the Phantom Rod. Or maybe they came up with their own solution from there. So that's that first session. Or, I'm sorry, that's the campaign as a whole. I have the first session already outlined. Pretty detailed. <laughs> and this is a lot more detail than I normally do for my sessions. Uh, so keep that in mind. But I, I really wanted to kind of... For some reason, I wanted to really up the production level of this. So it, it starts off with the investigation, um, and then they follow up on leads. They have they should have three different leads, and if they only get one or two of them, then each of these leads will point them to their missing ones as well. They could potentially hire a very powerful NPC for this first adventure only. This NPC will not go back into the jungle. Um, a dragonborn rogue, a female dragonborn rogue named Belcoria Ardas. And then uh, from there, they deal with the specters of Shatrokas. And now this is some good prep... Uh, uh, prep advice because I want to use specters for and let's transition over to D&D Beyond for this I want to use specters for this first adventure but the characters are only level 2 and that's going to be a problem because specters are uh, <laughs> very nasty so um, let's go to D&D Beyond let's find specter we don't want the night veil specter we don't want to see our 10 we want to see our 1 
So let's look at what the Spectre has. AC 12, 22 hit points. Okay, so far not bad. Easy to hit. The problem is that they have resistance to non-magical attacks and a number of magical damage types. So that means, especially against level 2 PCs, the Spectres effectively have 44 health. So I think I might drop their... I'll, I'll leave their armor class at 12. I think I'll drop their hit points down to 11. And then that will put them at 22, essentially. Because if something has resistance to a damage type and your players can only do that damage type, that thing effectively has double the hit points, since they're doing half the damage. So I think I'll cut its hit points in half. Um, everything else should be about the same. Uh, but can't speak. That's going away, because I, I want these specters to be able to talk. Sunlight sensi sensitivity, yes, because they only are going to come out at night. Okay, now life drain. This is this, because this could kill a uh, level 2 player character. So I'm going to drop the 2 hit down to 3. I'm going to uh, drop the damage down to 1d6 necrotic damage, and I'm going to give it the same effect. Target must succeed on a DC 10 con saving throw, or its hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the damage taken. Mm, I'm going to say reduced by 1. Rolling 1d6, reduced by 1. And now I'm just thinking the math. Average level 2 player character is going to have, what? 7. Low, low would be like 7 or 8 hit points. Average would be probably 12. So yeah, if they get hit by life drain, I roll a 6 on damage. They take 6 damage and their maximum hit points are reduced by 6. That's devastating. So yeah, I think just reduce their max hit point by max HP by one. I think I might even reduce the damage to a D4. Because it's doing a D4. It's essentially doing a D4 plus one damage. It's just you can never heal that plus one. I don't <clears throat> excuse me. I don't want to. I want to scare the players. I don't want to run them into the ground. Also, part of the part of the way that I'm going to avoid a TPK here is that the Spectres aren't attacking the players. The players, the heroes witness the Spectres attacking. NPCs, like just civilians. And so that should spur them to action. I'm not tracking experience in this. We're doing milestone, like I mentioned earlier, milestone or milestone leveling. And they'll be level two right before this happens. They'll get their second level. So that'll be kind of a fun opportunity then as well for them to test out their fun level two features. Oh, excuse me. And I realize, I just realized now that you guys can't see. <laughs> D, D beyond as i'm looking at all this so we're gonna turn there we go so this is the specter sheet like i was looking at um <clears throat> like i said keep the armor class at 12 drop the hit points to 11 drop the damage to a d4 it deals it re reduces their hit points by one and then i can describe these specters like i expect the specters to be uh looking like tribal lizard folk not like this whoop, as i bump my mic not like this you know humanoid ghostly figure but more like a lizard folk uh and then i can describe the specters here as just like ghostly lizard folk and then as they encounter the specters of satrocus through the campaign i can eventually get them back to this level and maybe even stronger than this as the players level up and then I can describe them as having, like, these specters of Shatrokas have, um, like, ghostly red eyes or uh, a spear and or they carry, like, weapons or um, they leave uh, wispy trails of lightning or whatever behind them. I don't know. I'm just making that up. Uh, and that would be fun. If anybody has input or anything or questions even, uh, feel free to mention in chat. I am. I am. Oh, I thought I was watching chat. Apparently I am not. Uh, so let me refresh this. As it's disconnected from chat. We're going to join chat. Yeah. So if anybody has anything to say, uh, feel free to say so in chat. Um, uh, anything, anything to Im any input or anything like that, I'll happily field questions as I'm going. But yeah. So specters are tough for a level one, I'm sorry, level two group. And that's why, like I said, we'll, we'll power them down pretty significantly. But now let's talk about prepping the future of this campaign. And I think that's that's a good way to do this, is that maybe I'll talk about what I have prepped so far a little bit in a session or in one of these episodes, and then I'll talk about what I want to do going forward. So I have this blank page here. We're going to use this. Um, how often would they be fighting the specters? How many at a time? This is a single encounter, uh, and I'm planning for no more than two specters. So four level two PCs, maybe a CR3 NPC ally alongside them, maybe, if they do well, 
and uh, no more than two specters uh, is what I'm thinking, and powered down as well. Um, because, like I said, I and maybe I'm erring on the side of caution. Maybe I should keep it at a D6 damage, one hit point reduction. God, I'm getting too hung up on these specters. Uh, I'll come back to them, and maybe maybe if I have some insight on them before our next episode next week, I'll share that with you as well. But it is a single encounter, at least here, and then I won't deploy the specters again until I feel like they're more ready for them. I would definitely nerf the life drain damage, but they only fight one. But if they only fight one, I wouldn't nerf much else. Um, I'm that's true. I I do want to use more than one, uh, because I'm not. I try to avoid using single monsters as much as possible unless I'm really going to homebrew that, and I'll talk about that system in a future episode. Uh, so I'm definitely going to use at least two, maybe three. I want to drop their damage. I want to drop their life drain. Uh, or I'm sorry, the like permanent reduction to HP. And I really feel like their hit points should be reduced as well, but we'll come back to that. Um, so let's talk about prepping going forward. So now this is a hex crawl that takes place in a huge jungle. And one thing that I love about, um, about tomb of annihilation and just hex crawls, hex crawls in general is random encounters. And you need, I know there's some people that kind of balk at random encounters and for some campaigns I would, but for a hex crawl, they're, they're, they're the meat of the campaign. They're, they're the stuff in the middle of the sandwich that brings players from one, you know, like what they deal with after the setup and before the climax. So let's look at the tomb of annihilation, random encounters and see how they break this down. I haven't looked at this yet. Okay, so they have random encounters for their starting city. And then they have wilderness encounters. Oh, and they break it by... They break it by area. So an encounter at the beach. Um, with In the jungle with no undead. In the jungle with lesser undead. And in the jungle with greater undead. Because in Tomb of Annihilation, there are undead in various parts of the jungle. And that's part of how you know you're getting close to the target city is when the undead are much stronger. And then in the mountains, in the rivers, and the ruins. I like those categories. Um, let's look at my map again. So let's switch us back over to Scrivener. And I have it on the blank sheet. But we're going to go down here. Oops, nope, I need the introduction. There we go. So what do I have? I have quite a few because I wanted everything to be interesting. We have thick jungle. We have grasslands. We have hills. We have uh, light jungle, rivers, well, not really rivers. We have lakes, for sure. Shoreline, obviously. Some swamps, some wetlands. Uh, oh, yeah, there's the uh, fungal forest down here, the mushroom forest. And then mountains and hills. So I have quite a few. So let's make a list. We have light jungle, heavy, whoops, jungle, shoreline. Uh, hills, wetlands, mountains. There's a desert in the middle as well. Um, the mushroom forest is going to be kind of its own special area, so I better make sure that I have that on here as well. And I don't have plans for any of these areas yet. Like, I don't expect, I don't know what they're going to encounter at each of these. Um, that's, that's literally what this stream is for. Hmm. <laughs> Mountains. Oh, and crags. Are those crags? Oh, broken landscape. I forget what those are called. We'll just treat it as mountains. Mountains or hills. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight distinct, uh, distinct types of environment. Hmm. Now that means that I could make eight different random encounter charts. That's fun, isn't it? Okay. Now, and those could be percentile, like what we have with Tomb of Annihilation. They do everything percentile. And really what they have is they have one master list of all... I kind of like how they do this. They have one master list. Oh, hang on. There's more. I just realized there's a scroll bar all the way down here. Whoop. Swamp Wasteland. Oh, yeah, I need, like, a Ruins. I need, like, a Ruins option on there as well. Um, ruins. And then, as eh, Zakora won't have any random encounters, I don't think Zakora will be its own thing. 
And then I realized, I just realized that there's a second encounter list down here. What is this? These must be the... Oh, caches. Oh, it's just continued. 56, 57, 58, 63. Okay. So I kind of like this because then I just roll the percentile once and I just have to... Well, God, that does seem like a lot of work. And the less work I have to do in the session, the better. Um, hmm... So I could knock it down to a d20 table, uh, but that might be too few encounter types. I could knock it down to, I think in the in the DM's guide, they do a d12 plus a d8. So you get two through 20, but that's even that's even fewer than a d20. So yeah, that's, that's off the table. Percentile might be too much, but you can also break percentile into different brackets. So I could really only have, you know, 10, 12 different encounters for percentile. But then that just, the charts get huge. Also, there's the idea of like an easy or a dip or a hard, I'm sorry, a normal or a hard encounter based on how well they roll uh, for their traveling, for stealth and that sort of thing. So there really is no easy way to do this, is there? It's really just create a bunch of charts. So now that we have our biomes on there, let's make a second set. Uh, let's make a second set of numbers. And these are going to be enemy types uh, that I want to have in here. And I'm going to surprise nobody. Anybody who knows me is not going to be surprised by this first one. <laughs> um, Tomb of, there's, there's a reason why I used Tomb of Annihilation as my, as my inspiration. And that's because it features dinosaurs pretty heavily, and it's a jungle setting. And I love both of those things. Um, so I want dinosaurs in here, for sure. Also, I love the idea of undead. Um, that whole, like... Mesoamerican, uh, in, like zombie sort of influence. I think that's really cool. Um, that'll add a cool flair to it as well. Plus, there'll be lizard folk zombies, essentially, because the lizard folk are who live in here. But who else lives in here? There are other monster types. And what we're going to do is instead of looking at this anymore, we're going to scroll all the way to the top and we're just going to go to monsters. And let's look at all the different kinds. We've got aberration, beast. Well, we need beasts, of course. Celestials probably are not going to play a role in this. Constructs might, but I foresee them being more of like in the ruin sort of thing. So I don't think they're going to play a role in the uh, in the random encounters. Dragons? I don't know. I don't know. I honestly didn't think about there being dragons at all in uh, in the Viscaran jungle. Elementals will likely. Fey will definitely. Uh, fiends maybe. Giants maybe. Humanoids yes. Monstrosities yes. Ooze. Maybe plants, yes. Yeah, plants and news. I like them being together. And undead. Okay. So now we have an idea. Dinosaurs as a separate <laughs> as a separate group from beasts. Um what else did we say? Uh humanoids, lizard folk. And really, actually let's delete that and let's go oh the subtype. We have lizard folk. What other what other humanoids would be in there? Furbolg would be fun. Um, how about, not Dragonborn, Lizard Folk kindly take that, they take that role. What other humanoids would be in the jungles of Vizcarra? There's probably some human tribes, so we'll put humans. Um, some halfling tribes? No. What's a civilized race that would be really interesting to see a primitive variant of? Tomb of Annihilation has dwarves and gnomes. I believe. So let's avoid that. It's already kind of kind of given to see elves out in the deep wild, so let's avoid that. And this is a very these are for bogs are underrated. I agree. Uh also thanks for watching, uh everybody, the few people who joined us. Um and uh and specifically Jake for engaging in chat. I appreciate that. Um, furbolgs are underrated. I think it'll be fun to do that. And if there are furbolgs, that definitely means that we would have giants as well. Um, because in my... I, th I don't remember if they are in lore or not, but I definitely see furbolg 
as uh yeah they are they are like sub giants aren't they so in my experience or not in my experience but in my uh, expectation or rather in this world if you see furbolgs that's like a precursor to giants i also treat orcs the same way orcs are kind of like a precursor to giant sort of characters or sort of encounters um but what else loxodon in the jungle that could work there are asian elephants that live in the jungles of asia we could do loxodon um tabaxi oh yeah let's get some tabaxi in there that'd be fun i like the aracocra is it C first? I think I, I think I misspelled that. Who cares? You know what I mean. Birdmen. Birdmen. Um, maybe the tabaxi and the birdmen are caught in like this aeons long war. <laughs> ah, no, I'm just kidding. That's that's. I love tropes, but that's a little too, little too on the nose. Hmm. <laughs> Tortles. And let's do one more. Extreme Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Less dynamite, more slings and spears. One more. If anyone in chat has an idea, I'll leave that one open. If anyone in chat has an idea for a really cool, take take an existing player character race, um, and like one that's normally, normally seems civilized, and turn them into a primitive version of themselves. Um, I will add that as our seventh slot. But then we have giants, uh, dinosaurs, undead beasts, humanoids, giants, plants, and I'm going to loop oozes in there as well because to me they kind of they kind of occupy that same space where it's like, well, no, they don't because even though plants are sometimes uh, created like through magical means, other times it's just nature, just evolving, you know, on its own, whereas oozes generally tend to be a bit more magical in nature we said we're avoiding constructs fiends not necessarily i'm gonna put dragons on here just because that i think in the more mountainous areas they might run into a dragon or maybe in the depths of the jungle there could be dragons and then well the fungal guys like the mushroom guys with myconids will be in plants even though that's not a plant they're a fungus um what about sprite pixie fairy tribes make them chaotic and bloodthirsty yes thank you for reminding me fey are definitely going to be I, you know, I have the, <laughs> I have the list and you know what? I just, again, realized that, um, I'm making all this. There we go. There's my list. I apologize. I'm still new to this flipping back and forth between, between one view and another. I really need a second monitor, but I don't have one. So unfortunately we're gonna have to deal with me fucking this up occasionally, but I have the list on D&D Beyond here. Plants, oozes, oh, monstrosities. I'll kind of loop those in with beasts. We have some humanoids, undead, elementals. Let's get some elementals in there. Um, <laughs> elementals. Okay, this is a pretty good list. We have 10 super groups of different enemies, and we have um, potentially seven groups of humanoid enemies. Uh, still waiting on that seventh one and whether or not chat comes up with one that's fine um, I might come up with an interesting one too I think I might have tieflings would be fun to see like but the main enemy is a tiefling so I don't that could be a cool interaction though you know what um, let's just go to Volo's Guide of Monsters or rather let's just go to the player character races Yanti oh that's a good one, Sageless One. Why didn't I not think of Yanti? Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I wanted races. I want to put... Yeah, Yanti is going to be in there. I think they're going to be their own category, though. Because I, I foresee them having a pretty significant presence. <gasps> Goliaths? Bugbears or Hobgoblins? Yep, I use them a lot. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hobgoblins would be interesting. Knowles. Oh, Knowles would be good. See, there's so many options. Um I put I put the tabaxi on there simply because I never use tabaxi, so I'm kind of forcing myself to really dig into dig into them. And all the stuff that you guys are listing in chat are stuff that I normally use. Hobgoblins, bugbears, gnolls. Those are monsters that I like and that I use often, so that's why I didn't 
not I, I'm not going to say that's why I didn't include them because I honestly didn't even think of them, which is good because I'm forcing myself to think along a different different train of thought. Kenku and Arakakra could be in a bird war. I like that. I'm definitely going to include Kenku on there. Um, Minotaur would be interesting. Okay, so I'm going to just list a couple of these. I like Knowles for sure. I like the Minotaur. And I'm going to put Goliath on here just because that is... I don't use Goliaths a lot. And uh, the idea of having like a primitive Goliath tribe is actually kind of frightening. Um, so we'll include them in there as well. So we have a pretty good pretty good list. We have these. I'm going to not bold these. We're going to italicize these so they stand out. We have these biomes. Eh, they're not really, they're kind of biomes. Uh, we have these environments. And we have these enemies. So now we have to, uh, they're all pretty much going to be present in most of them, except for the things like giants, dragons. Uh, those probably won't be in all of them. Uh, so... Um, dinosaurs are going to be everywhere, literally, because <laughs> they're beasts. Beasts are going to be everywhere as well. I like uh, what the Tomb of Annihilation does where they sequester the undead to a specific, like, region. Um, because then that, that kind of signifies this change. So I think for me, the undead are going to be around um, the shrines of the lesser deities. And maybe even in Zakora City. So that means there's going to be six points five shrines plus Zakora. There's going to be six points where undead are going to feature. Um, and since I don't have those listed on the map, uh, what we will do, I did it again where I was working in Scrivener without switching to Scrivener. I apologize. Um, so the undead will be, uh, they'll be sequestered mainly to ruins and surrounding environs. Beasts are everywhere. These guys are all going to be pretty much everywhere. I'll, I'll carve out their own little areas on the map later, probably in our next episode because we're getting close to our finishing time. Giants are going to be near the mountains and desert. I foresee these being hill giants and maybe some stone giants, but primarily those. Uh, maybe some cloud giants. I don't know. Plants are everywhere. Oozes are everywhere. Dragons are going to be... Um, there's a volcano on my map. So, yeah. Maybe the dragons hang around that volcano. And these are just uh, reminders for me. Fae are going to be everywhere, and elementals are going to be everywhere. Very soon. So pretty much everything is going to be everywhere. There's going to be a chance that you can encounter all these different things uh, anywhere you are on the map. So that's good. Um, I'm going to tackle the idea of charts later, I think, just because like in a future episode, just because the idea of creating nine percentile charts bores me to death. And I want it to be something that I can do quick while at the table. So I don't know. I don't know. Problem to solve for a future episode. But that's pretty good. That's a good start. Um, I think in a future episode, we'll also create, um, on D&D Beyond, we'll create our villain, uh, Scathus. And that will kind of inform what the Azure Rose is like. I've already created, I've already, I haven't said created, but I already, um, uh, like, outlined who he is. I know he's a bard. I know he's an artist. I know he paints, because that kind of stuff is, is seeded in that first little mini dungeon crawl that they have at the end of the first adventure. Um, so I have an idea for his personality and all that, and he's a tiefling. So that already tells us some things. But in my, um, in my setting, I have alternate subraces for tieflings. Uh, they're not all, they don't all have hellish resistance and infernal legacy. In fact, why don't I go to my setting document that I have on homebrewery.naturalcrit.com and I will have a link to that in the uh, in the show notes if you're watching this on YouTube. And right here, Eroth. Got to see all my <laughs> all my projects that I've started on there. There's a lot. Um, so I have all these subraces that I created specifically for this setting. And these are what the players will be able to choose from. Some of them are meant to be used in addition to the races in the player's handbook, like dwarves. 
Some of them are meant to replace the races in the player's handbook. Like, uh, like these humans are all, there's no variant human from the player's handbook. That idea where you increase two ability scores by one and you get a free feat, that's gone. So what I did instead is I created variant humans of my own that are themed around specific kingdoms or specific realms. Um, and then I basically created my own variant humans where they each get plus one to two different ability scores. They each get additional proficiencies and a, and, a, and a feat. But the difference is that I get to choose the feat. They don't. Since most of the players are new, they're not going to know this difference anyway. Uh, but anyway, tieflings. Because demons in my world can come from multiple different planes, uh, including the Abyssal Sea. So my abyss is actually an infinite black ocean. Um, and uh, the Astral Plane. So tieflings can be deeplings or moonlings. And each one has their own abilities. I haven't decided if Scathus is going to be one or the other, or if he's just going to be a regular tiefling, because regular tieflings also exist. Regular as in PHP, Player's Handbook. But the Deeplings, uh, what are they? They can hold their breath underwater for a long time. They have Abyssal Tendril, which is Thorn Whip. Uh, allows them to cast Thorn Whip, but instead of Thorn Whip, it's an inky black tendril that rises up from the water near your feet. Um, I, I guess that would mean they have to be in water, which that doesn't make sense. So, But anyway, it's a tendril. It's a tentacle. It's not a, it's not a whip, not a Thorn Whip. And then Abyssal Beckon, which... Uh, if they're in at least 15 feet of open seawater, uh, they can cast Augury and speak to one of the demons of the Abyssal Sea, which is really cool. And then Moonlings are astral uh, astral plane tieflings, tieflings with uh, um, lineage from the astral plane. And they, oh, my chat just timed out, so let's open that back up. They get resistance of the void which gives them uh advantage on saving throws against paralysis stun and they take half damage from force damage and then they have legacy of the void which is a lot like infernal heritage or whatever infernal legacy for regular tieflings where they get dancing lights and then arms of hadar and then augury but augury can only affect uh demons of the astral plane so Deeplings get augury from level one, but they can only do it in 15 feet of open seawater, which really limits their abilities. Um, moonlings get augury at level five. I think he's going to be a moonling. I like him having access to arms of Hadar, dancing lights, and also giving him resistance to force damage. Like that increases his durability, which will make him a better villain. Uh, a better antagonist for the players. So I think he's going to be a Moonling Tiefling. So we'll create that uh, at some point. I'm actually going to start it now. Create a monster. Uh, we're going to create from scratch. I've created a few things on here already for my... You know what? Yeah, let's, let's look at those. Let's not create something brand new. Let's look at what I've done already. So for my... We're going to shift to my other campaign now. In the closing of this, we started with it, we're going to close with it, um, my Ghost of Saltmarsh campaign. We only meet once every uh, three or four months, and we play for a whole weekend. So that really changes the kind of prep that I do. And the reason why I didn't talk about the prep in detail for that one a whole lot is because uh, I have a lot longer before that session comes up. Like I said, for Heart of Shatrokas, the players are making characters this coming Saturday, so just in a few days. Whereas for uh, the Ghost of Saltmarsh, or the Reign of the Sea Ghost, as it is called in uh, in my, as I titled the campaign, uh, we, we're not going to play until April, I think. April or May. I'd have to check my calendar. But anyway, so what we do to um, keep the excitement going is between sessions, through Discord or text or email, we continue to play, but individually. So the players go on their side quests at that point. Uh, there's no combat, but there's a lot of testing and a lot of like just skill challenges and not skill challenges, but skill tests and stuff like that. And I wanted to, like normally what I would do is if you participated in side quest material, then you start with inspiration at the next session, which that's great. But I wanted to provide them with something a little more. And so this is what I did is I created four specific, ignore Arjan, that's an NPC that I'll talk about later. But I created four specific feats and or spells for my player characters. And some of these might be a little overpowered, but we're going to go through these. So one of them is playing the captain of their ship, the Sea Ghost. And he is playing as a, uh, a battle master, which is my personally personal favorite class. 
Um, so I created this feat specifically for him to start the next session with. There's six level, I think, almost seventh. So he's going to get this. It's around six level. He's going to get it for free just for participating in side quest stuff. Um, this also gives me, like, why would I give them this extra power when pieces are already super powerful around, you know, they start to get exponentially powerful once you hit, like, seventh level. I'm doing this because then this also allows me to increase the difficulty of encounters I throw at them. But anyway, we're going to go a little past ten. That's fine. Captain's Command is a feat um, that he will get, specific to this character. His charisma score will go up by one to a maximum of 20. He gains one additional superiority die, which is a d6. But I already told him that if he takes Martial Adept, which is the existing feat that this is based off of, um, it gives him a d6 superiority die. All of his other superiority dice are d8s. I said that that will come in as a d8. I am totally fine with it being the same. Like, why keep track of a separate die that's smaller? It seems noodly to me, so we're going to avoid that. It's actually going to be a d8, not a d6. And then he learns two maneuvers that are brand new. The first one is failure is not an option. I foresee this being something he says to someone. So when an, al when an attack performed by an allied creature misses, you may spend your reaction and a superiority die to allow that ally to re-roll the attack. Roll your superiority die and add it to the attack's value. So most superiority dice add damage of abilities. This one adds the attack value because you want the person to hit. You want them to hit this time. Failure is not an option. And the second one is lock it down. When an, this one's a little more detailed, but basically, I'm just going to paraphrase. What it means is when an ally fails a saving throw, um, you can spend your reaction and a superiority die to you then make a charisma saving throw. You roll your superiority die, add it to your charisma saving throw, and if your saving throw beats the DC of their saving throw, they are considered to have succeeded. The only caveat is that you have to be aware the fact that it has to be a targeted ability, so it can't be like Fireball, and you have to be aware that the ability was cast on them, or called for that saving throw you can't just um you know it can, if like if it's a mind control thing you have no idea necessarily if that's you know whatever so anyway um we have a priest uh, or a cleric of talus so i created lightning shield as a spell um there is no lightning shield spell which i was surprised uh, i think there might be something i don't know what it's called but there might be another spell that does something similar but this one has its own unique flavor spend your action you touch your holy symbol or you touch your holy symbol to another character the touched creature is surrounded by three spinning balls of crackling electricity. The spell lasts for one minute or until no balls of electricity remain. When the creature, when the target of the spell, would receive damage from a melee attack while the spell is active, one of those balls burst, and it uh, creates an arc of electrical energy that hits the attacking creature for 1d6 lightning damage. No save. Um, additionally, if you are struck with lightning damage while this spell is active, you may spend a reaction to increase the damage of the next ball to burst from 1d6 to 1d8. So if Thunder, who is our... I keep bumping my mic, I'm sorry for that. If Thunder, who is our Cleric of Talus, uh, casts this spell on, let's say, our Battlemaster, our Battlemaster gets hit. Um, so the ball, one of the three balls bursts and hit for 1d6 damage. Then uh, Thunder, the Cleric, gets hit with lightning damage. He can spend his reaction to go the next ball is super powered. It's going to hit for D8 and 7D6. You get three chances, three hits with it, and then it's done. If you cast it at higher levels, you get an additional two balls of lightning for each spell level above the first. I think this is going to be a fun one for him to play with. Might be a little overpowered. I think I might drop the higher level cast down to one additional ball instead of two. Um, but yeah, I think that one's really fun. Regrowth is for my druid, which, sad to say, I don't think this one's ever going to... Um, ever going to get used because this druid player uh is not he's not super active in the in the between session stuff which is fine like he, we all have our own schedules and everything but anyway regrowth is uh it's a bonus action um you touch a character lasts for a minute when you spend the bonus action to do it and at the start of each of the target's turns they roll a d4 and restore that many lost hit points if they receive acid fire or necrotic damage the next time they would roll dice for the spell they don't so it, it delays the, the regrowth, the regeneration. And then at higher levels, uh, you cast spell at higher level to roll additional d4s uh, instead of just the one. And then finally, this one is really cool. I love this one. This one needs to get... I'm, I'm going to change this one. But this is for my uh, champion. I have a half-orc champion in my party. Um, and he's doing a lot of stuff with uh, the Scarlet Brotherhood. And this he doesn't know he's working with the Scarlet Brotherhood. But he's making contacts in the criminal underworld of Saltmarsh. And so he has, he's going to get the, the Underworld Bruiser feat. Which increases his strength or con by 1 to a max of 20. He gains expertise in intimidation. So he's going to add double his proficiency modifier to his, his 
uh, intimidation rolls. And then after he resolves an attack action, he can spend a bonus action to make an immediate unarmed attack. Add your proficiency bonus to the attack. If it's successful, you deal two plus your strength mod modifier in bludgeon damage instead of one. So he's getting a bonus, damage bonus of plus one. Then if the attack is successful, you may attempt to shove in addition to dealing damage. So you do the shove mechanics, which are you test athletics versus athletics or, dex or acrobatics, and then you can either knock him prone or push him back five feet. So he's going to be swinging twice with his greatsword and then making an unarmored attack and either knocking him down or pushing him away. Like, that's really fun. Part of the thing is he kind of lamented the fact that the champion, all the champion really does is they hit harder. That's, that's it. Um, so I really wanted Underworld Bruiser to give him something a little more tactical to play with. So yeah, that's it. Um, that's pretty much... That's pretty much it. Uh, we talked a lot about Heart of Shatrokas. I'm really excited, uh, and I'm also excited to talk more about Ghosts of Saltmarsh next time. I also, uh, yeah, thanks. That's pretty much it. I don't really have an outro. I should have written a script. Like I said, I was going to. Um, but thank you for joining. Um, I uh, hope to see you guys next time, next week on Wednesday. As always, uh, you can go to nicholascorey.com to see uh, more of my stuff. I'm an independent writer. I write space fantasy and sci-fi and medieval fantasy. If you like any of my books, I have like seven of them available on my website. You can pick those up. That'll help support me and support this stream and everything else I do in the future. And as always, you can follow me at Nicholas Corey on Twitter. So thank you very much for watching, and I will catch you guys next time. And now we're going to transition out. Here we go.